Tonse Kiwao Nitotama Lindsay Dupre Disina Kasun. On behalf of the Indigenous Education Network, it is my pleasure to welcome you to our event today on pandemic parenting. This event is very special to me and important, both in my role as Indigenous Education Liaison here at OISI and as an auntie and mother raising my Cree Metis son on this territory. While my Metis family is originally from the Metis homeland in Manitoba, and my partner is from Waterhand Lake First Nation in Saskatchewan, I also have settler ancestry here in Southern Ontario, and I myself was born and raised in Mississauga. I have tremendous love for these lands that were originally and continue to be cared for by Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and Wendat peoples, and deep gratitude for the ways in which this place has connected me with people and knowledge that make me a better parent and guest. I'm committed to carrying out my work at the university and responsibilities as a mother in ways that center reciprocity and care, important teachings tied to this place, with the belief that clearing pathways for joy amongst Indigenous, Black and Black Indigenous children and their families can be a powerful anti-colonial act towards our healthier futures. To give you a bit of context about this event, the IEN was formed in 1989 by a group of faculty, staff, and community members at OISE to advocate for Indigenous education and research. It's a discursive space for Indigenous education that works to advance Indigenous education praxis. The IEN's primary role is in convening conversations around critical issues that intersect with Indigenous peoples' lives. We also provide a range of co-curricular supports and are invested in advocating for and supporting Indigenous, Black, Indigenous and Black students, staff and faculty. Over the past few months, I've been fortunate to speak with a group of students at OISE who are balancing responsibilities of parenting with grad school life. Some of these students are on the call with us today and I wanna note how incredibly generous and trusting they were in sharing their experiences with me. I want them all to know how much these conversations have meant to me and how it's helped to renew my passion for this work. While there's a long way to go in making universities safer and more generous places for our children and families, perhaps these types of conversations and the relationships that come from them can help nourish our spirits while we navigate our time here. Now, before I turn things over to our incredible moderator, Tasha Spillett, I want to note a few housekeeping items. We've enabled closed captioning. So if you'd like to use that option, you can and have your Zoom updated. You can um, find that function on the bottom of your screen. We'll also be recording the session and a summary document is going to be created for those who are interested in supporting us to share the key points of discussion with their colleagues and other people across universities and in other spaces as well. Lastly, to protect this conversation from potential Zoom bombing, we're using this webinar version and uh, have decided to disable the chat. So we welcome you to listen in, to sit with us and hopefully feel like you're in a room filled with aunties um, and relatives that are going to unpack some really important um, conversations and, and reflections for our communities. So with that, Tasha, if I can hand it over to you to introduce yourself. Thanks so much for being a part of this. Thank you, Lindsay. I'm watching in Totemek, Wapi Omameaskwendigasun, Wapi Maskwandodem. My uh, given name is Tasha Spillett, and I am Cree and Trinidadian. I make my home here in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Treaty One. And I'm joining you from my daughter's nursery because <laughs> this is uh, one of the only spaces that we have that doesn't have a little, um, little girl crawling around in it at this very moment. And so um, I when, when I was thinking like, oh my goodness, when can I, where can I do this, um, this Zoom? I thought, you know, how fitting that my one little place of refuge for this conversation would be her her nursery so um, welcome to my daughter's nursery and I'm so happy that we've been able to create this virtual community for us to share space in together um, this afternoon so I uh, I am uh, an author and an emer like emerging academic I'm working on my PhD right now um, and most recently and most importantly, I'm a new, a new mother. So my daughter's name is Isabella Gijigoweyabek Onik Sumner, and she was born March 3rd, 2020. And so right before the real crap hit the fan in terms of the pandemic. So I gave birth to her on March 3rd and we came home March 4th. And it was March 9th that our city went into lockdown. 
So quite literally, I've spent, you know, the last coming on 12 months, um, both trying to figure out how to be a mother um, and isolating at home. And so, um, you know, all those thoughts and dreams and imaginings I had when I was pregnant with my daughter, you know, thinking about the baby shower and the ceremonies that go along with welcoming new children and, you know, you know, imagining the the great celebration and gathering that would have happen to welcome my baby, um, all just kind of fell when when COVID nineteen hit our city, uh, and so I you know I grieve I grieve that I grieve having had lost that opportunity or that experience of being a new mother able to share her brand new baby with the expansive and beautiful kinship system that we have as a family and as a community. And I think that, you know, part of part of parenting is being able to rely on that community of care on those kinship systems to be able to figure out, you know, how do I even how do I even do this? <laughs> how do I how do I mother and parent and you know, still eat and take care of myself and juggle all these things. And, you know, like everyone on in this online community that we built here, also, you know, the additional work of being a grad student and being part of a community um, on top of those responsibilities as parents. And so I acknowledge um, that I am the moderator here, but I'm probably the most junior parent on the call. I have a lot to learn still about parenting and, and motherhood. Uh, but I'm so happy to be able to share space um, with you all here this afternoon. Uh, so before I started my journey as um, an academic, really um, being an author and a writer was probably one of my primary identities. And um, writing is how I connect deeper to myself and how I make sense of how I move through this world. And having, you know, having had this very unique experience of becoming a parent during a pandemic has changed the form in which my writing uh, presents itself. And I am grateful for my daughter because she has made me such a more decisive and clear person and, and communicator. And it's interesting because, you know, I just did a call before this one in which we were talking about how do we make space for our community members to feel belonging within our circles. And I was thinking, you know, before I had my daughter, I used to tiptoe around a lot of things and try to make everyone feel comfortable and okay. And, you know, now because since becoming a mother, I just feel like I have this fire in me that makes me so much more clear and decisive. Like, you know, if I want my daughter to have a world that's worthy of her and I'm not willing to make any concessions. And so I think that that's um, such an interesting part of how parenthood shapes maybe the work that we do, especially as grad students. Just to begin, um, before we have this afternoon, we're going to we're going to be having two conversations. The first conversation, um, we'll, we'll be joined by two students on the call, and then the second with the other two. But before we jump into those conversations, I just wanted to share um, a poem that I wrote when I was, you know, sitting at home rocking my newborn, and the world was quite literally like just changing shape all around me both with the pandemic, but also with the murder of brother George, George Floyd in the States and the uprising of the Black Lives Matter movement and the land back movement here in Canada. And so uh, I'll just share this poem and then we'll start with our discussions. Parenting in a time of protest doesn't mean you're sitting on the sidelines. The revolution wakes you before the sun comes up. It asks you a million questions a day. The revolution wants kisses for where it hurts and extra cuddles at bedtime. You breastfeed the revolution, tell its stories and sing its songs. The revolution calls you mama. The front lines are wherever our bodies are and some of our bodies are at home raising the revolution. So I was feeling just totally separated from the communities that I belong to. And then I realized, you know, the most important work that I'll, I do is quite literally here raising my daughter. Um, and so I share that with you. And I'm so excited to just jump into this conversations that we are going to have this afternoon. So I invite the first two contributors to unmute themselves. 
Um, the theme for this first conversation is navigating the challenges of current parenting context. And so how about uh, we're joined by Fernanda and Adel. So how about we just introduce, if you could introduce yourselves, and then I have some guiding questions. And if you're willing to consider them, I think we could have a really about cool, about 20 minute conversation. Fernanda, do you want to begin just with introducing yourself? Um, yes. So uh, my name is Fernanda Yenchapaxi. I'm a four-year PhD student at OIC at the Social Justice Education Department. I've been living in this land for like a long time now, 13, 14 um, years. My first full winter ever here. It feels like I've lived like three winters on a road in these past six months. So, sorry, six weeks. Um, since you know my arrival i think that i've been learning and reflecting a lot what it means to be in this territory and what does that mean for my kids um who are you know half indigenous half white uh, it's different probably very different experience than it was for me um that had both the same like indigenous and so um families um but i was living in a in a land that it was closer to me than probably it feels for them um, I'm a parent of two extraordinary kids. Um, they really are. One is a seven-year-old and the other one's a three-year-old. Um, and as a parent, and I think them, um, I'm always wondering uh, what does it mean to be a parent and to be a child um, here and in my connections with school, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's why I'm, I'm also a sister, a daughter, a partner, everything full-time seems to be. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm excited to be here. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Adele Halliday. I'm a part time doctoral student in the social justice education program. I'm working in my doctor of education. Um, in addition to that, I work full time. I work full time for a nonprofit focused on um, anti racism and equity work. And in addition, I'm a parent. Um, my spouse and I have two children. Um, who are aged four and one. Um, they're both both very young, energetic girls. <laughs> and um, our family is a, a, a cultural blend. So um, I was born in Canada, but I'm of Caribbean descent. My spouse is originally from East Africa. So we are trying to raise our children with understanding the, their diverse cultural heritages and their awareness of um, the communities that they come from and their connections around the world and what it means to be on this particular land here. Thank you. Um, and so uh, you both have very young children and I, I was up six times last night with my daughter. So after this conversation, if you have any tips with that, please feel free to email me because I would definitely appreciate it. Um, the question first kind of guiding questions that the organizers offered for us to consider are what extra stress stress or challenges have you had to navigate while being a grad student at this time. Um, and how has your family adapted and found ways to kind of support support you through it. Um, do either one, yeah, Fernanda, thank you. Um, I, I think that I have found, I mean, I, I'm not sure if the challenges are any different from before. Um, I think these challenges have, that the ones that I have faced and that I see other parents or students um, also facing are probably challenges that we always had since we registered for school. Um, I think that the last year has, if anything, has just made them more difficult to um, or more visible and a more like has felt a little bit more probably on our bodies that they had before um, because we have less space to just you know kind of forget about them um, but it hasn't changed probably from um, from before I think the first one I'll, I'll probably talk about the time like I identify the time um, the university or the institutions establishing like frameworks um, or like of time that are uh, reflecting in like deadlines or um, how you know how the education works like first year and second year and third year and imagining um, Im imagining just the temporality of being a student um, in in a framework that does not incorporate um, any sense that will center anything else than just the academia 
um, and you as a student, uh, which does not allow you to think of uh, times that uh, are flexible for people with parents or for people who are full time workers or who are half time, <laughs> you know, have a, a lot of care responsibilities, like everything. Um, when Adair was saying I'm a part time, I was like, well, I should say I'm a part time, but I have to say I'm a full time. And I think there is idea that when you are a full time student, you're determined or you're conceived that you don't have anything else in your life other than being that part of that identity. And in my case, um, that has been hard, um, probably harder in, in the last year because I'm a, I'm a full-time mom while I have to be a full-time partner and while I have to be a full-time worker and I, well, not full-time worker, part-time worker and a full-time daughter and a full-time sister and a full-time granddaughter, you know, like, trying to provide care also for, for the people that I love. And I feel that um, that understanding of what full-time means for the academia, it's just, it's just not possible. Like it is not, I don't even know why they have that. When it's, it's, it's really, it's really, really hard to like, ask even your family to adapt to your full-time like university um, thing, because it's, how do you ask a kid that? Um, so in my case, um, that has not necessarily allowed my kids so much to adapt to, like adapted to my full-time, being a full-time student. Um, and like, and this is like very honest, I think I have adapted more to their schedule than they, to mine. I, I have asked them, I think at the beginning um, we were, I was asking them or I was saying that, you know, they can do this and they can adapt to, to what I need, but it really, I think at the end of or like the last couple of weeks, I kind of gave like the last months, I, I gave up. I, I cannot ask them to to adapt their needs or to adapt their times and to adapt their, you know, eating, uh, eating um, uh, schedules around my work. Um, so I don't ask my family to adapt too much to me. Um, whether this has repercussions on my school, yes, like for sure, <laughs> in my work and my ability to meet deadlines, absolutely. But I find that it's really hard to ask my family for that um, because they didn't choose to be, um, you know, my uh, like children of like a student. They, they choose me as a mom and they see me more as a mom than anything else. And I feel that I, I cannot ask them too much to adapt. Or like I don't, I don't know. I, I ask them less to adapt to my, to me being a student than for me to adapt to just their needs. That really like landed quite deeply in my heart. Like that idea, like you know, they didn't, they chose me as a mom. They didn't choose me as a PhD uh, candidate or student. And so I thank you, I thank you for that. Um, Adele, how how about yourself? Yes, thanks for that. I think. Uh, for me, the, the biggest stressors are time and space. Um, I think before I had uh, children when I was studying, it was fairly easy to use a weekend or a holiday to do the schoolwork that I needed to do. Um, now on a weekend, um, when um, the kids are home from school or daycare, they see their mom and they want to spend time with their mom and go to play and go to the park and do whatever they can do, even in these restricted times. So to then tell them, um, you know, much of what Fernando was saying, to then tell them, oh no, I'm not available, I have to do schoolwork is, is a real challenge. So it means that the time I have available to do school is really around their schedule. So after I finish full-time work, after we've been parenting and after they go to sleep, so maybe late at night um, or very early in the morning. So the time available is fairly squished. <laughs> Um, and even, uh, so that's a time question, even the space question, I think is a challenge, particularly during the pandemic, because um, there's nowhere to go. So in, in non-pandemic times, we have a whole community around us who are available to help support and raise up these children. You know, there's family members, there's aunties, there's cousins, there's friends who would be happy to be with the children um, for a day or for a few hours and allow me or my spouse to have um, focus time for me to do my schoolwork. That's just not possible now. So even if my spouse were to take the children, um, there's nowhere to go. So they might go to another 
area of the house. <laughs> they might go to a park, but then they come back and the children are very much aware that I'm still there. So they're calling me, they're wanting, you know, they're running into the room and playing, they're typing on the keyboard, they're trying to help typing on the keyboard <laughs> because that's what they see me doing. So to have the focus time to do the in-depth research and study becomes a, a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the timing is also a, a particular challenge because, you know, as Sasha, you mentioned you're up multiple times with your child at night. So if, you know, if I think of myself as a parent, I might say, okay, I have Tuesday evening to do this particular piece. Then my child is up, they're sick, whatever, you know, I might be too tired to do what I need to do on that Tuesday evening, or I might be distracted, or I might need to be running my child somewhere. So there's a whole level of stress um, that comes along um, with parenting, particularly in a pandemic, because there are no additional supports outside the household who could help with the time and space issues. Mm -hmm. And I think also because my, my children are so young, I mean, much like Fernanda, they don't understand, um, you know, if, if, I, if I do say I'm a student, they, they actually think it's funny. <laughs> they, think, <laughs> they say, well, how are you going to school? You know, they, they don't understand that dynamic. So um, they, it, it doesn't make sense to them at their at their young age. So so they just think that I'm, you know, doing something on the computer as opposed to spending time with them, which is what they what they really want. Having said that, I'm I'm deeply grateful for my spouse because there's no way I would be able to navigate this without having a, a, a partner um, uh, with two young kids. So all of yes, but all of that still adds stress to making sure that there's time for all these different facets of my identity as a as a partner, as a parent, as a worker, as a, all of these things and more and the other aspects of my identity as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I know like both of you express like, you know, being full time, all of these things, like it's, you can't just compartmentalize. Like I remember when I was working on my doctor before I had my daughter, like I could just shut off the world and be a focused student and, you know, there's not, there's not that there's like, I'm always a mom. I'm always a wife. I'm always a student all at one. And there's all these competing kind of um, obligations um, that are all full time, like you said, Fernanda. And so, um, you know, and then there's just, you know, the extra weight that I think goes along with motherhood in particular and the experience of, of mothering. Um, I with the organizers and I would also like to know how do political contexts and broader realities of racial injustice impact your work, learning and parenting. Um, and so I think like, you know, all of those competing identities that we kind of described, um, how do all of those things and how we move through the world and the skin and the bodies that we're in also impact um, us as parents and as academics. You can say no, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I so it's hard to <laughs> it's hard to like think about all the ways that I have that have impacted. I think that if you know I'm, I was born and raised in Ecuador in a time when um, that it was very different and it's prob that well in some ways very different than it's um, the the place where I'm living now in. Um, when I had to navigate, uh, like both having both, or like pro like going between back and forth between two identities, between two places, the urban and the um, and the rural and the indigenous and the mestizo and the educated, like the education and the just life and community living. Um, I think that I, I think that certainly has taught me. Um, ways of parenting um, where I myself relied a lot on um, like relationships. And for me trying to, it has, it has certainly been, it has certainly been, um, I'm not sure if it's, well, it is, I guess it is, a, it has been a political choice to establish a network of um, people who I admire and I love, um, who are part of just my, my work here, my like either organizing or my, or my school or my thinking part of the network that like people that I trust in their ideas and their thoughts and trying to bring them into my life so my kids can have that or can have them as part of their life as well. Um, so they, 
like the work that I do, um, I do a lot of uh, work on education, particularly on like protecting the public education um, system and a lot of like me, uh, working with like migrant workers. So I, I bring the people that I work with um, as part of my life so my kids can have them and not necessarily as uh, to be able to understand um, you know, the political context. Yes, we do have honest conversations with, with them. And sometimes, you know, you see, hear them like using vocabulary that I will use uh, because they just grow up with it. They, they hear it and they'll be like, oh, but this is so patriarchal. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know if you quite understood what that means, <laughs> but great. Yes, it is. <laughs> Everything is patriarchal. <laughs> and so I think that certainly it has been uh, like a part of a political uh, positionality of like thinking uh, on parenting or like bringing that people into my life. So they are part of their lives as well. And, and so they can have conversations with them that are honest as much as I can, as I can have. Um, I also, I also have in, been impacted by other organizers who have had kids and, and had kids before I did. And just seeing them, how they bring their kids to everything that they do. And I've tried to do absolutely like the same. So like they come with me to, um, they come with me to as much as possible, of course, but no, not all the time, but like as much as possible, they come with me to events. They like do posters with me. They print things with me. We make up rhymes that we're gonna put on Twitter or like we do a lot of the work together and not because I I want them or I want the movement to show our kids, but because I really think that um, that is just part of a responsibility when you are a parent. You can't, I wish that I can put them in a bubble and say, you know, this word is just so perfect for you or like, um, like to make a perfect word for them, but I can't do that because then they will be hurt when someone pops that bubble. Um, so I try to make them, I try to just include them in, in the work that, that I do as much as I can and to their level, but for sure. That's what I, that's why it has impacted me. Thank you. Um, yeah, I've been, I'm, uh, maybe I'll focus on the, the politics and parenting question. I've been um, really trying to, uh, we've been trying to raise up children who are both self-aware of their own identity, but also um, already trying to challenge the notion of internalized racism, which is already manifesting themselves. And they're, you know, especially the four-year-old who's so young, but it's really conscious of um, racial dynamics. And so we've been very intentional about teaching <laughs> anti-racism to her. But in terms of the broader political context, uh, I'm also um, conscious of, of uh, how much is too much uh, and too early. So, you know, she can sense my anger and my frustration around political events. So even earlier this year, the um, uprising in the US um, the death of George Floyd, even my full-time work around anti-racism when I'm, you know, I'm working and she's home and she can hear the conversations I'm having and she can hear the fuel underneath of, of my, um, my frustration around injustice, around the kind of the systemic injustice issues. And there are times where I'll hear her re repeat, the older one, repeat um, phrases. And I think that's too advanced for you. So, I mean, even in, um, in January, she was talking about um, police killing. And I remember she picked she picked this up for, both from the news that was playing in the background and the conversation I was having with a colleague because we were drafting a statement. And she said, so the police don't kill white people, but they kill black people. And so we had to debrief that and have that conversation. I thought, you're four. Um, how can we have this in a, this conversation, this, this conversation around police brutality uh, in a helpful way that helps you understand um, what it means to live in this world with a Black body? Oh, I wonder if everyone froze me.
Adele, I think uh, your internet is cutting out a little bit. It makes sense for you and your four-year-old self. Um, and other than what's happening politically, so it'll ask, and I'm always conscious of how much is in the systemic injustices. Um, uh, and Adele, can you just come back on just so I can hear your voice to make sure that our oh. audio is still good? I'm here. I'm back. Oh, good. Hello. Awesome. Yes. <laughs> Hello. Um, so maybe I'll just wrap up just to say, does she understand the, the difference? She's really young. Does she understand the difference between a system of injustice versus people as individuals? Because sometimes she hears it as um, individual white people as opposed to a system of whiteness and white privilege and white supremacy in which we belong. And that I'm challenging the system um, and that I'm not angry with individual white people. But that's a nuance. That's a very hard nuance for a four-year-old to understand. So trying to teach her the, the politics, not trying to weigh her down too early, <laughs> but yet very conscious that this is the world that she's going to be living in as, um, uh, as a, a, a Black woman. The little one's too young to understand any of this, but uh, <laughs> but she too can pick up on the emotions. So I'm always very conscious of, of the, the politics and 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 how that plays itself out as a parent. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, such such important points, and I think you know, um, like I was raised by an organizer, by somebody you know actively who pursues our our liberation, and I remember as a child being fearful of white people. Um, based on the conversations that I was hearing around, you know, the household, um, like as a child drawing at community organizing events, I remember being, you know, looking at white people moving around the community and being quite afraid. And so, you know, in raising my daughter, um, I want to be conscious, like you said, of um, how do we, you know, arm or equip our children with the tools that they need to navigate this world, but also protect their right to experience and live joyful, joyous lives, um, which is such um, such uh, a very finite thing to navigate. Um, and so, I thank you for your expertise and like your just your role modeling and how to make how to make that happen. Um, do either of you have any kind of thoughts on just, you know, what this year has been like. We have about a couple minutes for this, this conversation, what this year has been like um, in your lives and in your homes. And I know I felt, we felt like 2021 would hit and we would suddenly be like free and ready to leave our house and we're 2021 still in the house. So um, do you either have, either of you have any like th closing thoughts on just how you're doing? How are you doing? Um, I, oh, this is a hard one to respond. So I've been homeschooling my kids for the whole year. Um, and I think there is nothing that, you know, that the decision that I made that I regret of like keeping them home um, and being very conscious that that involves sacrificing other things that sacrifice involves sacrificing in school and sacrificing work and sacrificing it. Um, kind of just leaving a lot of the other things that I did in my own life on the side. Um, and I think that after a whole year, it really hit me. Not necessarily that idea of, wow, now it's been a whole year because there is like, it's been an incredible year with my kids around, having them around and me being around with them the whole time. Um, but I, I've been, right now, like going through um, a time when I'm like, okay, what else am I? Like, what is it that COVID has taken from me that I can't, that I want a little bit back um, because I can't, I can't stay on that, just in that just whole, no, it's not a whole, in that moment of like, just being a, a mom full time. Um, I know that I don't want that, but I think that it's just, I just, I'm just going through a moment when I'm like, what else do I want a little bit back in my life? Um, because it's just, you know, we, I don't know, like I, for me, it's like, it seems like I'm still in the first, it's been a one year of like the first lockdown. I haven't really, you know, left the house. So it's not like, I don't even feel that there has been two or three. I don't know, the economy has opened three times and I'm like, I still feel that it never opened for me. Um, 
So I'm in that moment when I'm like, okay, now it's been a year. What, what do I wanna, what do I, what do I need to recover? What do I need to leave and do a little bit of work on myself so I can continue to be what I need to be um, for my kids and for myself. So I'm just in that moment when I'm, I think people hit that, have, I've heard that people have hit that wall at different times over the year. And I think I'm, I'm there right now. Mm -hmm. I'm right there with you <laughs> up against that wall. How about yourself, Adele? Yes, yeah, so there's no question. It's been a, a challenge um, being at home all this time. Um, I partway through, um, I finished my, my maternity leave uh, last July and went back to work from home. <laughs> so I um, really haven't been to my office in um, uh, two years now, um, which is a very strange dynamic to return to work, um, but not be with your colleagues in a different kind of way. So um, feeling a sense of isolation, as, as many among us may be feeling, um, parents are not. So feeling that sense of isolation and a longing for community. So you know, I'm conscious my younger one, for example, interacts with most of her family members on screen. And um, I remember in, in the summertime when some of the, the restrictions were lifted, we went to go see a family member in person and she didn't recognize them because she's so used to seeing them on screen, was really scared and, and you know, so I'm just conscious of, of we're, uh, there's this whole connection to community that I feel like we're, we're missing and that, that I'm missing um, in terms of, of feeling isolated and, and how we connect to work and each other and 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 all of those things and even just the the, the idea of having um, play groups or adult conversations um all of those things i'm i'm um we are very much uh missing <laughs> and then i sometimes feel like um you know it the the challenge of not having those additional spaces means that sometimes i'm more tired to be able to engage uh to fully engage in any of these spaces i'm more tired to do my work, more tired to do school, more tired to do parenting than if we had these other um, opportunities available to us. So, mm -hmm. and I'm sure I'm not alone in that dynamic, but um, yes, it's a particular, a particular challenge. Yes, to having play groups, that would be incredible. Um, my husband just came and dropped off my charger. So there's an example of some extra support. <laughs> Um, so thank you for our two first contributors. We're going to move into our second discussion. And our second discussion, we're joined by Alyssa and Sherry. Um, and the theme for this discussion is nourishing dreams of healthier futures for our children. And this is definitely where my own um, passion lies since I'm really grateful for this conversation. Um, if you could both maybe start off with introducing yourselves and then I will offer the first discussion topic. All right, um, I'll jump in. My name is Alyssa Gray Titer. I am um, of mixed ancestry, which is always kind of a fun piece to start off with um, in acknowledging the land that I'm currently on. Um, I am in Brampton, Ontario, but my mom is actually from Nova Scotia. My dad is from Jamaica. Um, and then I have English and Mi'kmaq and Choctaw ancestry. So a fun little um, mixed bag of tricks. Um, I am a first year PhD flex student. And I use that flex very loosely because um, like Fernando was saying, uh, I'm doing everything full time. I'm also a, a middle school teacher. Um, mm -hmm in Peel and so I teach grade seven full time and I have four kids in this household. So I have a 13 year old bonus son and then a seven year old, uh, I have to think of my kids ages, a seven year old, a five year old and a four year old. I have to like measure them against each other uh, because I had them like almost back to back it feels like. Um, and so it is super, super busy here. And uh, if at any point you hear screaming and falling down the stairs, that's normal here. So <laughs> yeah, that's kind of my life here. Thank you, Alyssa. First of all, tell me how, four children. My gosh, I will be hitting you up after this for some pointers. Uh, Sherry, would you introduce yourself, please? Well, thank you everyone for the opportunity to be here. Um, 
first of all, Tasha, my baby, was born March 3rd as well. So we have a, we have a consanguinity of, of, of uh, things we could talk about, about how to nature that. Of course, I say baby and she'll be nine on March 3rd, but she'll always be my baby. So thank you. Um, I guess by way of background, I am currently a second year PhD student at OISE in so, uh, social justice education with a minor in women and gender studies. Uh, by way of my being or positioning, I was born in Toronto, but uh, I have, uh, my mom was from Guyana, South America, and my father who's passed, he was from Grenada. So I hold a citizenship in both, place, uh, both places. So that's sort of interesting in terms of myself. Um, and I have, as I said, a nine-year-old, and then I also have my 80, soon to be 81-year-old mom that also we live together, and of course, extended family that uh, do not have uh, children or, or sort of next of kin that I've sort of morphed into being responsible for. So it truly is a community of parenting of different sorts, but uh, parenting nonetheless. Thank you. Thank you both for joining this conversation. I'm just going to offer um, the first guiding question. How do the children in your life influence your theorizing in education? Um, so either one could just jump on, on that question. Oh, she's passing off. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, I, I, I guess we're, we're both, uh, you know, we can both be together. I think um, my daughter influences everything I do. And of course, my theorizing education comes from uh, the, the the unpacking of the emotional trauma I felt uh, in, the, in the education system growing up in Toronto and looking at some of the ways in which it still manifests today in her education and ensuring that she is aware of herself, has a strong sense of self, a strong awareness, and as Adele said, the right words to be able to combat things that happen. And, you know, her too, as Adele said, you know, she's eight, but she's a very, uh, straightforward young eight-year-old because I try to raise her as we're in a multi-age household. She's going to get, you know, my mom's 80-year-old perspective. She's going to get my perspective, her dad's perspective, you know, the great aunts, the uncles. And so she's trying to navigate all of that with just being eight. And so she does influence me because I want her to have a good foundation of what education is and understand that it's not only textbook, it's not only bricks and mortar, it's, you know, on PA days, baking with my aunts, like that's part of education, that's part of history, it's part of her culture. Um, it's, you know, going to different festivities that we can really enrich and learn about the foods and how that works together, because I think that's all education that shapes who she is. And so when I'm looking at how she influences, I have to look at things through her eyes because she is the future. Not saying that I'm not the future, but I'm at a certain point in my education and in my studies and in my pedagogy, but I want her to be able to, you know, understand her positioning and just be a strong young black person and realize how education can move mountains and what the barriers are and how she can circumvent to still achieve what goals she would like. And if not, then to use the words and the language to be able to, you know, deconstruct or at least challenge whatever narratives they're trying to put in front of her. Thank you. I think for me, um, my children were the reason that I started really digging into identity. And identity has played a large role in not only my teaching, but in my theorizing as an academic um, and understanding what it means to carry uh, multi, like identities from, from different places, different spaces. Um, and it was because prior to having kids, my identity truthfully wasn't that important to me. Um, I knew I was mixed, that was enough for me. Uh, my mom, uh, is very, I guess she's, she's light. She really could, she looks almost Filipino sometimes, um, but has none of that ancestry. And then my dad looks very Jamaican. And so for me, that was enough. I didn't need to know kind of beyond that. Um, but when I had kids, I realized perhaps that identity piece that I was missing was something that they really needed in their lives. And so I really started reclaiming knowledge, reclaiming teachings um, from all of my ancestry um, to really give my, my children a foundation of who they are and their sense of belonging in the world because I wanted it to matter to them. Um, I didn't want them just to be like, oh, well, I think my mom's confused and my dad's this. Like, I wanted them to very much have a foundation in who they are and what, what those ancestral pieces um, do for their, their sense of identity. And so 
um, it's been really interesting. Again, my my youngest three um, are still fairly young, like seven, seven, five, and four are, they're kind of like out to lunch most days. Um, but they're very interested in, in teachings. And that is really important to me. And so um, in choosing when I, when I started my master's before I even got into my PhD, um, I decided not to stay local or learn locally. Um, I went to another institution out east because I knew that I would be able to connect with elders, uh, with Mi'kmaq elders and, and get that piece of knowledge that I, I wasn't getting here in Ontario. Um, and so that was really important to me. And I did some land-based learning. So actually like living on the land and, and getting all of those teachings that I felt like I was really missing. And I was able to pass some of that on to my kids and that that's been the biggest piece of all of this. Now, as I learn, um, it kind of funnels, it funnels through them in, you know, kid-friendly language. Um, but all of my, my theorizing comes from identity and trying to navigate identity politics without it being identity politics for them. I want them to just know who they are regardless of, of what's happening in the world. And isn't it interesting how, you know, um, like I think before we become parents, we kind of positions ourselves as the one to impart knowledge on somebody else, but it's really children who do a lot of teaching um, and are the catalyst for a lot of teaching um, and learning for us as adults. So I, I totally um, understand what, what you're saying. Um, another question that we wanted to look at, um, I'm gonna bridge these two questions together. So what do you want the future to look and feel like for our children? Um, and also how can the universities that we are in relationship with demonstrate more care for us as families to try to make these futures possible? I'm looking at you both like. <laughs> I feel like, yeah, I feel like it's super heavy. <laughs> I feel like that's a, that's a really, it's a loaded, a loaded question. There's so much. Um, so it, when I imagine kind of my, my children moving through the world going forward, um, again, I think from the academic in me wants everyone to be more informed um, because I feel like knowledge is power and the more knowledge other people have, the there will be a difference in the way that they interact with my children. And my, I feel like I want my children not to have to fight as hard as, as I've had to fight, as we're currently fighting right now, just for, I feel like, basic human decency, right? Like we are, we are literally fighting for people to see us as humans. And that for me is so troubling. I, I need my children to not have to deal with that. Um, and then what can the university do again, from a, <laughs> it's hard, right? Like as a, as someone who was in the institution, in the academy, um, I say like, please offer me X, Y, and Z supports. But like, as an academic who is like decolonial, I'm like, break the system, it's not working. <laughs> um, and so there needs to be a reimagining of what it means to be um, a learner in this space and what it is that I, like, what does output look like? Um, is it always, a 20 page paper in every class. Like, is that really how I'm demonstrating my learning to you? Are there other ways that we can look at, um, you know, products? Um, in, a, in a middle school, we even look at like conversations, observations and products, but like academia is so focused on what have you published? How many pages is it? Um, did you cite it APA down to the last like dot? Mm -hmm. um, you're measuring my intelligence based on things that don't make up who I am as a person. And so I think we need to start again, kind of finding the humanity in all of it. Thank you. Um, Sherry, do you want to engage with that one? Yes, please. So I think there it's twofold. One of them is I think a little bit of fight is a little bit of passion and spice. And I think that, you know, we don't want aggressive fighting for the things that we're looking for. But I think if every generation has something that's distinctly their passion or their sort of a, a plight, it, it, it provides them with the, the, the less complacency and also more visibility, which allows 
these sort of things that we have to not go so far and that we have to sort of say, well, now we're adding on top of this. It can be sort of taken at the moment and they could be more understanding of it. And I think that these younger generations, maybe the, you know, the 13 to 17 or the, you know, the, even the under, the under, you say your four-year-old, those, those four to 10, they, they are coming up in a different way. And their, their use of language is very, to me, very, much more aware and, and more mature than perhaps I was at that age because they have the accessibility or because, you know, we're fighters and we're, you know, educators and as, you know, Fernandez and the others were holding more than one hat. So we're mommy at home, but mommy's, you know, watching her lecture online in pandemic and cooking up the food and changing the diet, like we're doing multitasking on a whole new level. And so I think that's part of it. What can the institution do? I mean, we're always looking at space and fighting for space and trying to reclaim space. So, uh, you know, at U of T, they have a well, I haven't had to use it because of the pandemic only once, but they have an accessibility for family, like a little family center in the Robarts Library where, you know, families can sort of be there and, you know, have their children make noise, let's sort of speak. So maybe, you know, I've had lectures where, I mean, the reality is I can't get there, right? Like my partner's at work till late, my mother's not there, like there's no community. So I have to take my daughter to class. And, you know, I appreciate the liabilities of that, but there was a space at least made for that you know, others who also have children had sort of the kids at the back, and even if it's a coloring book or whatever they're doing or the head to the iPad, but they were even started that community. And I think that to me also brings possibilities. So, you know, it's not when I was growing up where there was no possibility of me going to university and I'm saying all these other negative uh, stereotypes and things to me. My daughter at eight already knows she wants to go to university. Now, you know, what shape and tail that may morph into it, but she's been saying, you know, I want to be a scientific technologist. That is not even on her life of, I don't know what I'm going to do. She's already seen that there's something that she could do. And so I think believing in possibilities nurtures that spirit that certain things are just gonna be the standard for them, but no pressure, but allowing them to know that they have a choice in what they wanna do and how far they wanna go. And seeing us as mothers holding different hats also makes them, as you said, wanna emulate that behavior. It wants to make them have conversations. It makes them wanna inquire a bit and look at different things. And I think all of that ties into education supports. What can universities do? Universities can also, have maybe programs where they wouldn't have thought about it. So maybe have a day where there's, you know, a showcase for children of graduate students. And if, you know, as you said, if there's arts or other things they've had, the children can be part of that experience. So they can see if mommy, you know, puts you to bed at night and falls asleep cuddling you and sort of sneaks out of your bed at 10 o'clock to write her paper till midnight or draw a picture or they do whatever it is, the children can say, wow, you know what, my mom has done this or parents or whatever. And that allows them to be like, okay, you know what? Maybe the next time, like for me, we talked about pandemic, my desk is large. And so half of it is with grade three homework. And my daughter doesn't want to sit upstairs at her desk when I'm down. So she wants to be right beside me. And so, you know what? She's seeing that she's being there, she's learning and she's investing. So she sees the structure and it becomes second nature to her because she's involved. And so when I'm like, you know what, honey, I can't watch this show with you today. She says, you know what, mom, let me read next to you or let me do something. And so she gets that engagement as a young black girl, she's getting empowered, she's questioning, she's learning to interrogate. And to me, I think that's sort of how it would be and how we can support families as well as allowing family members to know what you're doing. I have a list, they'll know me because I'm a lawyer too. So I'm list oriented and tasks, don't laugh at me. And so I literally have a chalk, a chalkboard, a whiteboard and one of those cork boards upstairs. And we have a list and a structure and it has, mommy is unavailable, she has a presentation today. So they all know they have to fall around, get in snacks, manage themselves don't come at me you could probably see my mother in the background trying to wave at me i'm like i'm on this hour but part of parenting part of being at home and this is what we have to do and i have between four and five pencil yourself in for what you need to do and so we're not always structured but at least them knowing when you have stressors because as we know being a grad student being a phd student there's always someone trying to get some knowledge or some pressure from us and well so i think trying to do that and i think involvement really does help and i think it's empowering mm -hmm. thank you so much and you know, I just want to share that this time we've had to get together has been so cathartic for me, just um, as somebody who's been so separate from people and from adult conversations. I just thank you, um, Alyssa, Fernanda, Sherry, and Adele. Thank you so much. So we have um, just a couple of minutes. I wanted to bounce back to Lindsay just to do our closing of our space here this afternoon. Thanks so much, Tasha. It's funny, I, I was so... I think this is a testament to parenting. I was so prepared to do, you know, an opening that made sense in my head. And now I'm so immersed in this conversation and thinking about 
picking my son up at daycare that I don't have anything um, super formulated in my head to close with. Um, but maybe just to end with, you know, more words of gratitude, um, as we've, we've spoken about over the past hour, your time is so valuable, and there are so many demands on it. And so to sit together here, even though it, I wish it was in person, at least to see you all to hear from you. Um, it means so much to me, it refuels me. And I hope that um, each of you found this meaningful in some way or another. Um, and, you know, a shout out to everyone who joined us over the past hour and are listening closely. Thank you. Um, thank you for prioritizing this as part of your learning today. Uh, and I hope that we can translate some of the knowledge and the perspectives that you shared today um, within OISE and in other spaces. Again, like I said, it's there's a lot of work to do, but I think the more that we can connect and we can keep re-energizing one another and creating these you know, communities of care, um, we can at least keep going and make it um, a little bit more positive of an experience and nourishing as we as we do that. So we'll say goodbye. I hope everyone has a, or at least see you later. Um, we will hopefully connect again soon and I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. <laughs>